Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> Good. Um, thanks very much. Thanks for the warm introduction. I'll try and stop being so productive. I think it's time for me to slow down a bit. Um, some of you may know that I nearly didn't get here thanks to the Chilean volcano. Ash plume which spread across uh, Australia and delayed me for two days in getting here. So I'm very pleased to be here actually. Um, Carter just suggested that I should uh, reenact a volcano to um, start the thing off, but this is not going to be a volcanic keynote. <laughs> what I want to um, I talk about today, and I hasten to add that this is uh, very much my own personal perspective on, on a number of issues, and I'm not claiming that this is the only way to view the world. And I certainly do not have a theory, a theory of so uh, networked social systems, nor do I have a universal method of analysis for networked social systems. So please don't expect that. What I, the, I want to do three things really today. The first thing is, thi the first thing is this, to argue and explain why uh, network theory and network analysis are different. Maybe I don't need to do that in this, with this group, but that's what I intend to do. Um, secondly, to illustrate how a networked theory and analysis go hand in hand with an actual um, case study that we've done. And thirdly, to talk about representations of network system and how the classic representation that we use so often may not be always the right one. In the end, it's a plea for a package deal between theory and analysis. The word network, so the term network social systems already carries theory with it, I put to you. And uh, this is my take on what counts as a system. There are, of course, plenty of other definitions and uh, I, I don't claim primacy here. But I think you need elements in a system and they need to be interdependent. And I emphasize that word because I see that as, as I will explain, as the core of network theory, interdependence in some form. And also, automatically this carries with it a multi-level con concept. You have elements and you have a system. So you have outcomes at both the, the element level and the system level. Social. I think there are many ways of construing social, of course. Uh, thinking about this, I thought what's important here is that the elements in the system exhibit some form of intentionality towards each other. And I've listed a number of um, um, contrasts just to think about the type of uh, intentionality that people can, or, or actors of some form, can, can do to each other, can, can relate to each other. And so I think that that's um, a really important element, that these are actors in a social system, these elements. And networked is in many ways the most controversial of all, I put to you, even though for us here it might seem very obvious. We're not just saying that there are relationships among the elements or among the people or the actors. We're saying that from a networked perspective, the relational ties are the sinews of the system. They're really at the heart of it. Um, they're not abstract. They're not like Kurt Lewin's interdependence of fate, whereby you might be, uh, because you are part of one social category, you might share the same fate as people in this, other people in the same social category, whether you know them or not. That means that, in fact, the, net, the social network ties, I think, are at least in principle knowable by the individuals in the system. So you know whether you have relationships. You might be wrong but you can know. The social ties are dyadic, so this is not a group view of the world. And they are the vehicles through which the, the social actors exhibit that intentionality. Now, lest you think this is obvious, I hasten to add that there are other theoretical conceptions. Those of you who know anything about social psychology will know social identity, self-categorization theory. And these theorists argue that it is the social categories that count. Yes, people have relationships, but those, those ties are outcomes of other more basic processes. They're not the sinews of the system, as I said before, whereas we claim the, uh, the opposite. So there's a lot of theory in using the term networked social system, and a lot of network theory I put to you. 
Also, when we're dealing with uh, political networks of various types, indeed any sort of networks, I guess, there's also an issue of scale and of level. And this was apparent right from the very beginning of this network discipline. This is the uh, New York Times, page 17, April 3rd, 1933, and it reports Jacob Moreno, who was interviewed, the founder of social network analysis. Now, you may not be able to read that. I realize it's a bit um, blurry. If we ever get to the point of charting a whole city or a whole nation, Dr. Moreno added, we would have an intricate maze of psychological reactions which would present a picture of a vast solar system of intangible structures powerfully influencing conduct as gravitation does bodies in space. Wow. <laughs> no wonder he went on to invent psychodrama. <laughs> Such an invisible structure underlies society. So at the very beginning, Moreno had this idea that we should not just, you know, we should chart a city or a nation, heaven forbid. And that's ambitious. In another life, when I was doing some rather poor criminology at the Australian Embassy in Moscow, we had this as our domain of interest. Now, is it really, what is it going to give us to do a network chart in some sense of the whole of the Soviet Union? There's an issue of level here, and maybe, maybe it is important, maybe it is important, and certainly the, uh, the individual actions at a local level make, um, explained a lot of what was going on. But certainly, there were aspects of the Soviet Union that were importantly networked and needed to be understood. And so in a sense we have this, um, if you like, two systems at different levels entrained in some sense with one another. I don't plan to explain how we might, we might come to analyse this, although I will give you a few hints about multi-level networks later. Interestingly in this system, there's a really interesting feedback effect. So the gerontocracy tried to preserve itself and kept the system, the large-scale system, running um, slowly and uh, poorly. But eventually it had to be replaced by a more radical Politburo which unleashed social forces that fed back to change the entire structure, our entire country. So what we end up with is, is a kind of multi-level structure where something from the top feeds down to the bottom which feeds back and changes the top. The other example I like is the People's Action Party of, uh, uh, this is the first PAP government in Singapore. And the thing I particularly like about this is that these men, Lee Kuan Yew, Go Keng Sui and others, were not big strong men, as you can see. They did not have AK-47s and rocket launchers in their hands and yet they cleaned out the Chinese triads. They did it through a systemic method of feedback across levels whereby they could, um, they could uh, influence the social structure and then that fed back to outcomes at the system level and the individual level. Now that's a really interesting point because it's a systemic explanation that's required here, not whether these individuals had certain qualities like rocket launchers and so on. It's a very non-Rambo view of the world but it's the only explanation that's applicable. And so, there's not, it's not just what the individuals have that counts. When we do, and I'm kind of in a, work in a psychology department, which is very individualised, and we do what I would call individualised social science by and large. We search for factors that explain whatever individuals have the properties they have, the qualities, the issues, the problems. We look for associations among variables or differences among individuals. I think that networks are different things. Here our search is more for the patterns that explain structure so that we can look for outcomes. So what counts as a good network? Why is the, the Singapore leadership structure workable and long-lasting, whereas the uh, Soviet structure was not? at least in the last 20 or 30 years. Now, very, various of our members 
um, have in this community have had explanations for this. And you know, I see John Paget up the back, and I think he's got the most profound and interesting of those explanations. But it's a very different thing from individualized social science. This is what we do in standard, what I submit we often do in standard social science. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It just depends upon your conceptualization of the world. You know, psychology department, we often have two groups of people, we put them in two boxes, so to speak. Psychologists never think of them as nodes of different sizes, but I do. And so, you know, they might have different qualities. They might have rocket launches or IQ or whatever it is that they have. And we can look for differences between them. The statistical analysis to do that depends on independent observations. However, if there are <coughs> relationships that count in some way among these units, that assumption becomes untenable. And the boxes, in a sense, start to disappear. We've still got colours on the nose. But the, the, simpler, the simplistic analysis fails if there are these complex interdependencies. And I started out by saying that complex interdependence is the essence of a networked social system. So if we have a networked view of the world, if we think that networks count and are important, if this is our world rather than the two boxes, then we actually can't just run regression or analyses of variance, even though they're very convenient things to do because they are relatively simple. So interdependence is not the problem here. It's not a problem at all. It is the substance of what we do. It is the point about networks. It, dependence is not something to wish away. It is the content of our work if this is what we how we construe the world. And structural patterns, I put to you, are the essence of, uh, of dependence. So if we have red people and blue people, that's fine. And the general linear model can cope with that quite well. But once we start putting relationships between them that in some sense count, we start to undermine the system, that an analytic system. And that's a theoretical point. It's not an analytical point. So, for instance, if we theorise that being connected to a red person can make a blue person turn red, which we often do, then we can't assume independence because the heart of the theoretical argument is of dependence. Of course, there's another way of getting to this pattern, and that's two red people might form a relationship because they like each other, because they're similar to one another. That's a selection hypothesis. These are what I call structural patterns. Here they involve attributes on the nodes and relationships between the nodes. The, la the last example, however, is about the formation of a network tie. So are there other ways in which ties can be formed? And I put to you that there are, and they don't always involve actor attributes. So dependence among network tie variables can lead to patterns in the data irrespective of actor attributes. There are a couple of simple examples. One that we know full well. Um, a two path like this might be closed. And we see triadic closure very commonly in human social networks. So that's a pattern that if we observe frequently implies that ties create the presence, create the circumstances for other ties to come into being. This is an issue of dependence, not among, act among actors, as we might think is the easy and simple way of um, thinking about that issue, but among the ties themselves. Another example is that popularity may be self-creating, a kind of preferential attachment hypothesis. This is a patterning which arises because certain ties, certain patterns of ties create the presence or the preconditions for further ties to come into being. There, so there are many possibilities here. Those are not the only type of ties. Things that we often look for also reflect dependence. 
reciprocation. I mentioned triangulation. Denser regions of the network in terms of multiple triangulation, what Mark Newman referred to as community structure. These higher degree nodes, hubs in the network, preferential attachment type processes. These things can occur irrespective of the actor attributes. And this is a very different world from that individualized social science that I referred to before. So here are some questions, not the only questions, that I think are at the heart of network theory. What are the structural patterns and their outcomes? So here's a good question for us all, because I don't think anyone really knows the answer. What counts as an effective network in a particular context? I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. What are the factors that affect structure? Is, does the network, do the network ties self-organise? Are there exogenous factors that come into play? The dynamics are important, but and there's a lot of work being done on dynamics, but I'm not going to uh, talk much about that in this, this presentation. And then, I put this last, but I see this as most fundamental, and I'm going to come back to it at the end of the talk. The examples I've shown you so far have been of networks with one type of node and one type of tie. That's a particular network conceptualization. Is that the best representation of a, social, a networked social system? That these are couched as empirical questions. You know, you could imagine looking, except perhaps for the last one, you could imagine going into some data and looking for that. But I put it to you that, sure, you can do that analysis, but these are theoretical questions. We need theory to guide us as to what to look for in this sort of analysis. I'm going to show you an example of what I think is a clearly network theory. It's actually a network theory of network governance. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you how we might use it to build hypotheses about, about patterns and how we might analyse it. Now, I know there's been a lot of work on network governance in, in recent years, and many of the people here know much more about it than I do. So, again, I'm not making great claims. I'm using this as an illustration to, um, to show you the kind of way that I think about these particular problems. It's a great pleasure to present this with Steve in the audience because it comes from Jones, Hestley and Bugatti, 1997, where they present what I think is not all theories of network governance are actually, to my mind, network theories of network governance. The network governance literature itself often says that, or sometimes notes that, the networks in their network governance are loosely conceptualised, um, uh, sometimes used even just as metaphor. This, however, is quite clear. We can be quite specific in this theory about what to look for, as I'll show you. Jones et al. theorised that an effective network governance would have some properties. What, what, what they called relational embeddedness, structural embeddedness, and macroculture. And we've just written about this. It'll appear shortly in public administration, so if people want more details, they can look out for it there. Now, I need to go through these three terms. They'll be familiar enough, I think, to most, if not all of you. Relational embeddedness is about uh, strong relationship within dyads, within pairs of network partners. Now, this makes perfectly good sense. You would expect in a, an effective, this is about an effective system of network governance, you would expect that there would be some strong cooperative relationships between some partners. Now, how do we uh, actually consider that? Well, one of the important components, and Brian Uzi's more recently written extensively about that, is reciprocity. So I'm going to present to you a very simple hypothesis that in a well-functioning governance network, we accept, expect to see the presence of reciprocated network ties. I don't expect every tie to be reciprocated, I'm not that naive, but I expect to see more reciprocated ties than I would otherwise expect to see by chance. Structural embeddedness, according to Jones et al., 
related to the extent to which the dyad shared uh, partners and the extent to which those partners themselves were connected. So this is a closure argument. Closure has, has many um, interpretations in the network world and has been talked about a lot. You know, it goes back to social capital arguments of Coleman. Um, we've obviously got Granovetter, which I've cited up the top there, uh, speaking about network embeddedness more generally. Closure, a closure triadic pattern is a kind of embryonic or a kind of um, archetypal pattern for collaboration and cooperation, but also for scrutiny, for the enforcement of norms. You can, if you're connected to everyone else in a little group, you can see them all and you can see whether they're doing what they should do. This is a, an important element that I think makes perfectly good sense in an effective system of network governance. In this community, more, more recently, Barado and Schultz have talked about the importance of closure as a mechanism for handling risk, managing risk in these types of governance systems. So, here's the second hypothesis. In a well-functioning governance and network, we expect to see the presence of triangulated exchanges, triads. Macroculture is in many ways the most interesting of the three. And it's talking about how, yes, you need to have some sharedness of goals, um, agreement about how, how they should be implemented. That makes perfectly good sense. In a, in a governance system, if it's going to be effective, you expect there to be some sharedness about what's to be achieved and how it is to be achieved. Now, if I were to measure this fully, I would go to my... Um, uh, institutions or informants or respondents and I would ask them about their aims and their values and their goals but actually the important point here is the sharedness, the agreement. And so I put to you then that in a well-functioning governance network we expect to see fewer negative ties that involve contestation and conflict. So for this particular hypothesis, I don't need the actor attributes about what sort of culture should we have and what sort of aim should we have. I can simply see whether there's disputation among the ties. So this is a network theory of network governance because it presents me, my argument why it is so, is it presents me with three hypotheses, each of which are a patterned network presentation configuration that I can investigate. Let me show you a case study of what we did. Uh, this is uh, environmental governance of the Swan River in Western Australia. Um, probably very few of you have been to Perth, Western Australia. It is possibly the most isolated city in the world. No, I kid you not, it takes two days, three days to drive to another city of similar size. Um, it sits in a small, fertile area at the uh, southwest corner of the state and is otherwise surrounded by desert. It's not desert that... It's desert with advantages. It's desert, <laughs> it's desert that has tons of iron ore and other minerals that are currently being dug up at a great rate and shipped off to China. So Perth is like a gold mining town. It's a boom town. It's very wealthy. But without this water catchment, there is no Perth. Per capita, this is one of the wealthiest cities in the world. All of that money goes through Perth. So the importance of this river this system to, to the Perth made the state government invent something a few years ago in the mid-2000 uh, uh, mid called River Plan, which I'm not going to go through, but it consists of pages and pages of this sort of stuff, which identifies the lead organisation and partners and the key actions and all that sort of thing. It is actually a highly, highly top-down network governance system. Of course, it doesn't work like that. It's impossible. We, <coughs> we studied it by, of course, the advantage of River Plan is that you've got the key players already identified. So we started with 21 key organisations and snowballed out, asking about their relationships with other organisations. 
Um, this is the network. The yellow nodes are the key 21s, and I'm going to show you analysis based solely on the yellow nodes. And these are the important, we did more than this, but these are the important things for this presentation, the important questions. First of all, we've identified the partners that they work with, the other institutions, the other organisations, and we ask how important is that working relationship? And we also ask how easy is that working relationship? I don't care how easy it is. I want to know how difficult it is. But there's a certain kind of face validity to asking easy that doesn't trouble the participants or ethics committees. So <coughs> what I'm going to show you is an analysis of crucial ties and difficult ties, difficult or extremely difficult ties. And I'm going to interpret the difficult and extremely difficult ties as these ties of contestation, disputation. These are the crucial ties. These are the difficult ties. To some degree, they overlap. I'm going to show you, now I've got two types of ties. So I'm going to show you a bivariate exponential random graph model. There's been plenty spoken about ergams in the last days, so I'm going to say very little, except that it is, for those of you who don't know what it is, it is a statistical model that identifies prominent patterns, network patterns, in the network data. And so what are the patterns I'm going to look for? Well, I've got two types of networks. I'm going to look for certain patterns that involve only one type of tie at a time. So I, these are directed networks. I'm looking for density and reciprocity. I'm going to look for in and out degree um, uh, parameters, centralization effects, and closure effects. These are standard parameters now for directed networks, but it's a bivariate, so a bivariate model, so it's interesting to think about how the two ties might, <coughs> might connect with one another. So I'm going to have a, a, a parameter for when they line up together, and I'm going to have a parameter for when they are reciprocated. Now, I'm going to show you the results for a model which is uh, what I call a reduced model, just for the purposes of presentation. What I've done is I've kept the the density and reciprocity, uh, sorry, the density and the degree distribution effects in there because they're, they're good for controls. And other than that, I've only kept in parameters that are significant. Just for ease of presentation, I could present the whole model. And this is all the effects with parameters and standard errors and asterisks indicate significance. So I'll go through it bit by bit. We have low density, not surprising. There's some centralization on the in degree distribution. But it's also interesting what is not there, what is not significant. There's no reciprocation and there's no closure in this system of network governance and crucial working ties. These are the difficult ties. Low density, some centralization on popularity. I'm not sure that difficult popularity quite makes sense, but you know what I mean. But no reciprocation and no closure. And then we have the bivariate effects. These are very strong effects. Crucial ties are difficult. That's what entrainment means. They line up together. Exchange means a kind of bivariate reciprocation. You think I'm crucial, I think you're difficult. I think it's fair to say that these institutions occupy a highly contested political domain. And in fact, other analysis that we have in the paper supports that argument as well in more detail. So, what can I say then about the Jones et al. theory of network governance? Well, in re relation to this data, I can say there's no re reciprocity effect for either crucial or difficult types. There's no tendency for relational embeddedness. There's no tendency for structural embeddedness. And crucial ties are difficult, etc. So there's disputed macroculture. So Jones et al. identified three conditions for effective network governance. None of these conditions hold in this system of network governance. So I've got two choices. Either the theory is wrong, heaven forbid, Steve, or this is not an effective system of network governance. What can I say? Within two years of this study being conducted, the state government had closed down the entire system and changed the legislation and rebuilt something else. 
One case study does not prove a theory. However, this is the type of work that I think that we need to do across many different instances to see whether these types of uh, situations and effects show up, to see whether this pattern that I've identified here is prominent in all network governance systems, or is it just in poorly functioning network governance systems. It's a lot of work potentially, we need to do it context by context, but this is a way that shows that it can be done and that we can have a, a network theory which presents network hypotheses and can be analysed in a way which respects the dependencies, in fact builds on the dependencies in the data. So, finally, in the third part of my talk, If we're going to have a network social system, you will have noticed that already I have moved away from the one type of node, one type of tie. The theory of Jones et al. implied that there needed to be two types of ties to study. So this kind of one node, one type of tie is not necessarily the right conceptualization. What is the right conceptualization? Well, that's a theoretical question. What we need to do is to think about what are the important elements that we theoretically see in a networked social system, and we need to match that conceptualize, uh, our conceptualization with those elements. And there are many things that could be done. Many things that could be included. I'm not saying that we need to include them all, but we need to think about such possibilities. And interestingly, all of these things are within methodological reach. Some of them have been quite well established. In fact, within methodological reach is the prospect of putting all of these things together in the one model if we had the data and if we could get the data and if we thought that was a sensible thing to do. So the fact that we can do it doesn't mean that it's sensible. The only answer to that comes from the theory that drives us. I'm not going to go through all of these, but I want to talk a little bit about multi-level because I started out talking about multi-level, although this is a rather different take on it. Uh, it's not surprising, is it, that we should think about top-down and bottom-up processes as relevant um, in, in these sorts of social systems. And in fact, in some sense, we already do that. The, we use bipartite network structures. Uh, this is... Uh, Mark Lubell is going to be talking about this uh, tomorrow, so I invite you to come and hear about uh, another take on network governance based on um, um, the uh, uh, San Francisco Bay Area water management. Rather different from the analysis I've just shown you, but still uh, it explicitly takes into account that institutions come together and cooperate within, or organisations come together and cooperate in larger scale institutions. That's familiar, that's a bipartite network and there's many things that can be done with that alone. What I'm more interested in for these immediate purposes and the things that we've just started to work on have been something a little bit more complex than that. So Emmanuel Lazega has some interesting data on French cancer researchers and each of these cancer researchers works within a, cancer lo a medical laboratory of some type the researchers have links among themselves, as do the laboratories. Now this is, I put to you, a more general multi-level network, where you have two levels, expressly two levels, and you have networks at both levels and networks connecting the levels. Now here the networks connecting the levels are not particularly interesting because it's a basic nesting structure. I'd like to be even more general than the, this exogenous cross-level structure. What I would like, to, uh, I'll just do it this way. What I would like to do, what we are working on, is having a two-level system where at one level, which I, we can call it level A, it doesn't have to be levels, but it's a nice way of thinking about it. It could be other sorts of structures, but this is the basic data structure that we're playing with. We can have 
network ties. Amongst A ties, we have another B tie network. And then we have a bipartite uh, network as well. So the entire structure comprises two types of nodes, which here I've talked about levels, but they could be other things. They could be divisions or something like that. I'll show you an example of that. And we have three types of ties. We don't suppose that all the ties are the same. They need to be modelled separately because they're involved in different things. Now this, I think, is really interesting for all sorts of purposes. Um, we're interested in applying this to uh, uh, climate change adaptation, where individuals might, uh, might uh, work together at the one level, but also be associated with various institutions or political parties or whatever at another level which might also have connections of some sort amongst themselves. The possibilities are really interesting. A structure like this actually enables, this is a very big and pompous statement, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but a structure like this actually enables us to start thinking about macro, micro and meso arguments in a fully empirical way. That is a big claim. You can actually devise a, uh, an ergum for those, for that um, particular data structure with meso effects, that's the bipartite effects, and with within level and meso interactions, which I think are particularly interesting because that's the kind of uh, cross level macro micro thing that's of interest. Let me show you some possible effects. The simplest cross level effects involve these simple star-like patterns at different levels. And here, oh, I've got a pointer, haven't I? Oh, great. Wonderful. The talk's nearly finished. He finally discovers the technology. Um, here is, uh, so in this point, this node, if this were a positive effect, nodes, are pop that nodes that are popular within one level actually have lots of connections across levels. Very simple idea, very simple. We could have these kinds of complicated closure effects. We could have cross-level tri triangulation, shared affiliation, if you like. And this one is really, really nice, I think, to my way of thinking. Very simple again, but if there's a collaboration, sorry, if there are ties across level, then perhaps there's collaboration within levels. There's cross-level entrainment. This really is a kind of macro-micro, or at least my take on a kind of macro-micro effect if you take one level as micro and another as macro. I know some of you will have objection to that, and I'm happy with that. Let me show you an example of a simulation, a particular point here. I'm going to show some very simple, the only effects in the model, very simple. These two cross-level parameters. One is positive, so the blue nodes, if they're popular at one level, are popular cross-level. And the other, the other thing is reverse, where it's negative. So if the red nodes are popular at one level, they're not popular across level. So if all I look at are the red nodes, the A network, I get a network that looks like this, and I could go off and I could do a, you know, study that in whatever way I do, and I could say, oh, you know, this looks like there's a bit of triangulation and so on, and I could look at the degree distribution. And if that's all I did, I would miss out on something really important, the fact that the other network is very highly structured and it's got these two hubs. It's very centralised, not surprising when you think about the parameters, and that the bipartite network is also extremely hub-like, so that the overall network looks like that. So, my point here is quite simple. If the world really is like a multi-level network and we go and look at one network and not the other, we might be very wrong in our conclusions about what's driving the structure here. How do I know if the multi-level network is the appropriate picture? Well, that's a theoretical question. Let me show you an empirical example. This is not a multi-level example. This was just data I have to hand. It's a two-division two organisation. 150 odd managers and I fitted a model and let's not sit here, let's just quickly go through it. I'm nearly finished. 
let me show you that there are some cross-level effects. There are other effects as well, but these are cross-level effects. So I have one of the negative star parameter, cross-level star parameter. I've got shared affiliations. And I've got this cross-level entrainment effect. So the point here is that in this empirical data, if I only analyze within the networks, and not between the networks, I miss out on some quite important structuring effects. So, my conclusions are, we are quickly coming to the point where our network methods can handle some quite highly complex representations of social systems. Where different types of effects can be examined and tested against each other simultaneously. So we really are, I think, methodologically at an important point in time. But I don't think that network theory is well developed, partly because it's, mm, maybe I hesitate to say this, but I will nevertheless, partly because it's grown out of this individualized social science. And social theory is not always well adapted to translation into network terms. So my call is for us to start thinking networks in a network way not just as an addition to individualised social science to try and prove our R squared or something, and, and to think about how, what are the best representations of our social system. These are ultimately theoretical questions, although they can be tested empirically once they've been developed. Yes, it's complex. What we need to do is to understand the level of complexity necessary to explain our social system. This is something we have no idea about, I, sus I suspect. But because we can now put many effects in models simultaneously, we can always push the boundaries out a bit further until we reach the point where we, don't need, we know we don't need the extra level to explain something. So I guess my call here is to think about what's the level of complexity that we think is necessary, and then add a bit more to see whether that adds something to the explanation. Thank you. John. As a, uh, a policy studies guy, I was, of course, delighted that you presented a policy piece here. Uh, and it just points out, it seems to me, the, the challenge that the next decade has for people in, in the policy studies to try to get at these relations type of things. Uh, taking your study as showing th these certain structural factors that are there, and that according to one theory, at least, are, uh, are ill-advised in general, I would say that there's, there's really two types of issues that we really need to look at and need to be able to translate into these uh, network structures. One is, how did we get to that mess? That is, what, what are the processes? And by that I would say, what are the institutional structures and the individual utility functions and the individual characteristics that drive a system to that kind of point? And that, that's certainly the kind of thing that we can study fairly well. And I think that may be easier than the uh, other challenge, which is to ask, uh, under what circumstances would that kind of a system, in fact, be an optimal system? Because clearly, there's not going to be a single governance structure that's going to work for all kinds of problems. So again, thinking of the macro and the micro level as uh, contributing under, what, what are the factors on both of those levels for which certain kinds of structures work well and lead to pleasing outcomes, and which ones do not? So I see us as really. Uh, having uh, as a challenge th thinking one of how to actually interpret these funny little things you guys have already come up with and secondly come up with our own uh, perhaps uh, that, that may actually encompass some factors that, that have not been there. and I suspect that that's the challenge that you've been uh, putting forth for us in any I, I think you put it very eloquently probably more eloquently than me certainly, certainly more succinctly um, <coughs> 
Yeah, I think on, on, on the first point, I think, of, of course, um, what, we, what we need to do is to... <coughs> What we need to do is to think about process and then either model the process directly, that is dynamically, although sometimes it's hard to get the data, or to think about what the implications for that would be in terms of cross-sectional data, if that's what we require. And I think we can do those things for better or for worse. Uh, you know, maybe not as well as we might be able to in five or ten years' time, but we can start to the second point is a big challenge, I think. This is one of the big challenges, I think, for network theory in whatever domain. What counts as a good network, whatever we mean by a good network, an effective network or an ineffective network? How do we know? How will we tell? We can't just suppose because something's network, therefore it's good. <coughs> the Soviet example shows that that is not necessarily so. So what are the conditions? Now, of course, conditions will change, depending on context. But if we are to have theories and results, we need some level of generalizability. So we have to be able to search for a level that enables us to generalize, even if it's to say, well, in this type of context, it looks like that, and in this other kind of context, it looks like this. We have to find a way of doing this. This is, this is the scientific challenge I think the network community faces in the next um, 10 years or so. And you're absolutely right. Look, it's easy for me to sit there and invent data structures and you know, do little simulation studies and show them off in talks like this. Um, but we need domain level theory that is network theory. I think that's exactly right. So that involves you guys. Gary, um, so nice talk. Um, if I understood you correctly, one of the points you were making is that you get inference wrong if you don't take into account multiplexity. When you made that point that we're looking at this one network, and if we don't think about the second network and how it interacts with the first network, that, that we can end up having a flawed inference, I was expecting you to provide ex an example. So I'm wondering if you could provide an example of an inference that we, you know, through simulated data or real data that we would get wrong by artificially drawing the boundary around that first network. Yeah. And could you characterize the conditions under which you, we should be most worried about excluding that, that second or third or fourth level network? Ah, yes, that's a really good question. Um, look, I, I, yeah, all of those things need to be done. And, and uh, with this, with this multi-level work, which we've only just started on, I can't answer that right now. But in certain other contexts, um, I know, for instance, if you leave out, there are certain other models, if you, if you don't include certain network structures in the model, then you draw the wrong inference, uh, inference about attribute effects, for instance. I think these things are, are reasonably well known. So, and they're not just common to network science. They're common more generally, if, if you don't put in a factor, standard regression, then you, you may well draw the wrong inference. It's, it's always a problem about how we, to decide what's the right way to proceed. Um, so I, I, think, I think we can find examples. Uh, the question of uh, when or where we should uh, do it and set up the boundary conditions, um, I guess we can do that methodologically, but I guess what I'm saying is that I'd like to see that done theoretically, thinking about it. So, you know, I want someone to tell me, no, you don't need to worry about that. That doesn't make any sense theoretically. That would be fine. I'd be happy with that. Because we've got a plethora of possibilities, and I think we need to think about how to constrain that empirically, uh, sorry, theoretically. Now, of course, once you do that, you can then look at the things empirically, and you might decide that you do need something more when you actually go out to the empirical world. So there's a kind of trade-off here between analysis and theory and empirical work and, and so on. It's a package deal. So um, basically, I think um, another model of network analysis is to try to explain 
network structure with a function of nodal attributes and, and then the network theory. But sometimes I'm, I'm pretty confused sometimes or um, confused because of there is a kind of some uh, endogeneity issue. So network structure is, can be a function of nodal attribute and, and the network uh, attribute. But also the, this kind of um, nodal attribute can be influenced by the um, structure. So mm -hmm. how do we deal with this? Well, I the most compelling way to deal with that is to have longitudinal data and to use a stochastic vector oriented model, Tom Schneider's, or some other sort, uh, uh, some other similar model. Because that enables you to pull apart the influence and selection effects. I think that in some circumstances it might be possible uh, to, to do this uh, with cross sectional data. <coughs> With cross-sectional data, we face the same problems in the network world as we do in the standard social science. You know, you can't infer causality very compellingly from cross-sectional da data unless you have a very strong research design that enables you to control certain elements. And in survey data, you typically don't have that. So there are there are ways of dealing with whether it's selection or influence. Uh, but I think it, the data demands are higher because you're asking more. What we can say with the nerve is that there's some form of association um, and that there are other models that attempt to do the same thing. But it's just a matter of being careful about our cause of claim or something. Okay, please join me in thanking Gary Roberts. conversation in the great hall. <laughs> <laughs> uh,